Welcome to the Fane of Fantasy. This channel is all about giving you inspiration to master your craft and create fantasy that will truly immerse your audience. So today we are going to talk uh, a lot about cultures in fantasy settings. Uh, we're going to talk about sociology when it comes to um, world building. And there is probably a ton of things that we need to consider here. So we'll try to at least uh, get into some of it uh, in today's uh, video. And I have uh, Brian here to help me do that. So maybe you want to introduce yourself a bit, Brian. Yes, thank you, Jesper. I appreciate being on the show with you today. Um, my name is Brian Bass. I write under the name BK Bass. I do a lot of uh, fantasy, a little bit of science fiction, a lot of Pulp Fiction inspired stuff. I've been world building for a long time. I started doing it playing role playing games 20, 25 years ago, something like that. Yeah, that's that's good. <laughs> it's it, most of us fantasy authors uh, started world building at a very early age, actually. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's yeah, cool. I've been doing it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> but you wanted to talk about uh, sociology and, and cultures and that sort of thing. So where where do we start this whole conversation off, uh, Brian? Um, the way I want to start it is talking about um, you've got kind of like the circle of the three main parts of a book, of a story. Uh, you've got your setting, your character, and your plot. Uh, of course, setting is what makes fantasy what it is. You know, we're our world building, our fantasy settings is kind of what defines the genre. Um, but a lot of the professionals will argue that character is the most important part of any story. Uh, you can write an encyclopedia about your fantasy world, but not a lot of people are going to want to pick that up. Uh, but if you have this amazing story uh, about these interesting characters on this journey through this exotic land, then you've got you know a book that people want to read. And I think that uh, where sociology is important in this is it can be the glue that binds your character to your setting. Um, that really gives fleshes out the setting and fleshes out the character and their motivations. Um, I got a couple examples of how this could work. Uh, the bad example is you say you have a fantasy world, you have elves and dwarves, and you have this guy with a sword, and he has to go defeat the Dark Lord. And everybody's wondering why. Uh, the good example is let's say you have the same setting with your elves and your dwarves and this guy, uh, but he grew up in a militaristic feudal society that views other races as inferiors. So now you have somebody with warrior values feudal loyalties that looks down on other races. So you have a lot of social agendas to explore and you have motivations for the character and reasons for him to have these beliefs and motivations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the having, having reasons, I mean, it, it kind of goes beyond sociology as well, but, but in, in the whole having reasons for why characters do what they do is, is so incredibly important if uh, if readers and the, and any audience are supposed to believe what is going to happen uh, that the whole deus ex, ex machina kind of thing is just it's not working right exactly yes we, we want believable characters and having a believable setting really helps with that yeah yeah so when you set out to develop uh, sociology for your fantasy world so where do you start with it what kind of questions do you ask yourself and and, and that sort of thing well, the place I usually start with all of my world building is the cosmology and gets us into religion. And of course, that's a whole separate topic, um, but it ties into the sociology in different ways. And you can develop one or the other first. Um, you can either develop a society and then develop a cosmology that represents their beliefs, or you can develop your cosmology and consider how uh, that pantheon of gods or deities would influence the society. Um, so. The few building box blocks of the cosmology, I'll be real brief, because like I said, that's a different topic. Um, but how important is it? Are the uh, deities cosmic overlords? Are they actively involved in the setting? Um, are they revered or feared by the people, or both or neither? Um, what kind of religions are there? And is there uh, one standard pantheon that everybody accepts as the truth? Or do e does each culture have their own beliefs and practices? Uh, <clears throat> Once you have that figured out, you can figure out how they interact with the world. Um, how do the people view them? And different people are going to view them in different ways. You've got the common people versus those vested in the faith itself. Um, and then you have uh, educated versus not educated people are going to have different views and um, fear versus reverence and things like that. And um, where it really ties into the culture is your organized religion, setting up other temples. Do they have certain ceremonies? 
Um, do the religious officials have a official role in the society? Um, are they part of the government? Do they have a moral or a legal authority and how is that enforced? Um, we can look at situations in our own history like the Spanish Inquisition where religion had a really strong role in society um, versus at other times it was more um, of a moral authority but not a legal authority. Um, and we can also look at how each God influences the culture. A uh, good example of this, or an easy example, would be a god of war. Uh, a lot of pantheons had a god of war, um, but they had different roles to play. So you could pattern yours in different ways. One example would be Odin from Norse mythology. And he was a major god. He was the chief god. He was also the god of war. And in that society, warriors were revered. They were exemplified as the, uh, the epitome of the society. And they would favor individual honor in battle and uh they were hoping to earn a special place in the afterlife and they were reckless because death and battle had its own rewards uh the foil to this would be Ares from greek mythology who was not a major god he was actually one of their minor deities and um in that kind of society the warrior was not a real major cast of the society most of the people that fought their battles were farmers craftsmen and potters that had to take up the spear to defend their homeland so uh, strategies and tactics would be more important than individual honor. And you'd want to um, you know, maintain a viable workforce so you wouldn't want to be throwing men's lives away. Um, and there's all the other spheres of influence have different ways to affect this. If you have a major agricultural society, uh, a hearth goddess or a hearth god might be you know, their major deity. Um, nomadic or pre-agricultural societies might have a more nature-based religion, not actually have your big pantheon of deities. Um, a religion that has a structured pantheon of gods is probably going to influence a more more structured government with a set hierarchy of roles and responsibilities versus one with independent warring and competitive gods is going to have a more of an anarchistic kind of society. Yeah, yeah, and I, I like the whole. I mean, religion is always such a big factor in everything here, and and I also like the well. I always like conflicts, uh, you know, setting up conflicts, and and for sure, like you said, that you you can have the conflicts between the gods, but but it's also, I also like when you you can kind of with the same religion, even you can also create. Um, within the people or even the worshippers themselves that there will be disagreements about how to interpret things well it, that's kind of the, the thing that goes on in the real real world too where you know uh, uh, there will Absolutely. be arguments about who is god actually and uh, mm -hmm. um, or, or are you is something uh, a certain action is that a good action or a bad action and it, it all depends on how well the eyes of the beholder basically right so uh, right it comes back to uh, what kind of moral values and beliefs each individual uh like religion has and yeah. you can have two different cultures that have completely different views based off of their own uh, beliefs yeah yeah ab absolutely and uh um so 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 that certainly affects the culture so religion will always be a major part when when we're dealing with uh, with cultures and their view of the world and so forth but but what what kind of other elements should we think about in terms of sociology as well uh the next thing i would think about is the ecology um and that's the actual world and of course again that's another big subject but it'll affect your um the societies that you build um whether you have uh what kind of terrain plains and mountains versus uh jungles and swamps or coastal cities um, if you have cold versus hot environments and what kind of seasonal changes you have, um, what kind of flora and fauna is available, what kind of resources do they have? Um, a good example would be, let's say you have a, a society in a mountain environment with not a lot of open terrain. Goats are probably going to be more likely to be a food staple for them because uh, they don't require a lot of land. And it might be cold. There might be a lot of snowfall. So that's going to affect their architecture. You're going to have a lot of peaked roofs because snow on a flat roof will make it collapse because of the weight. Um, things like that versus a warm environment is going to have open buildings with like open plazas and loose area clothing and something, a uh, place with a lot of widespread land. Cattle might be more viable as a food stock because cows need a lot of land to graze on. Um, and a lot of this can dictate part of your society. Ancient Egypt is a really good example of this. Uh, their, a lot of their beliefs, their practices, their habits all revolved around the flooding of the Nile River. Um, most of their farming was done on the floodplain and annually it would flood over, moisturize the land and then recede and they could work the land. 
So almost all their beliefs were based around this annual cycle. So things like festivals and traditions, the agricultural cycle itself can all revolve around these things. If you have a society that's in an arid, hot environment or an environment that's always cold, they're a lot less likely to have uh, seasonal festivals versus a society with drastic seasonal changes your seasonal festivals, your harvest time, your planting time, that's all going to be a lot more important. Um, and then the agriculture itself, of course, is it a hunter-gatherer society versus agricultural? Um, if it's a vassalage type government, it's going to be dependent on surf labor. We'll get more into that. Um, but the, the actual lay of the land is going to affect the society quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and of course, it also kind of sets the uh, what should we call it? It 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 sets the level of what what people see as valuable as well. You, you know, uh, of course, it could be money, but but I've talked about this before with others uh, in in different interviews as well. But but I kind of like the idea of um, the culture um, maybe viewing things uh, as being of a certain value versus other cultures. Maybe they like their gold coins, but uh, but in a different culture and a different setting, you might have something completely different as the as the valuable item or the currency even. Uh, but but do you have any thoughts on, on economies and currencies and stuff like that when it when it comes to uh, cultures? Oh yeah, definitely. And and the economy plays a really big part in the culture. And um, there's yeah you know, a lot of things we can talk about there. Um, there's really three major systems that we've seen through history uh, is the vassalage, socialism, and free market capitalism. Of course, there's variations on this, but those are kind of the big three things that I identify as uh, ways we can look at building our society. Um, run them down briefly. The vassalage, uh, for anybody that doesn't know, is where the landholders are all nobles, they're titled lords, and they owe loyalty to higher ranking lords above them. And the lowest ones are responsible for an area of land, and they have servants and people working the land. And basically, the way it works is um, those people work the land, they're pretty much bound to the land. They don't have much freedom. They don't have any rights of property ownership. And they keep enough to feed themselves, but the, the produce that they create is passed on up the chain of command. Um, and this is going to be a very structured, hierarchical type society uh, with a lot of um, hereditary uh uh, lords and titles and things like that. Socialism is going to be a system where everybody works together for the common good. This works really good in like a small village. So if we got a small village and let's say uh, Joe's a carpenter and Bob's a farmer. Uh, Joe is going to build Bob's house for him, but Bob is going to feed Joe's family. And of course, you got 30 people in a village. It works in a lot of different ways. There's a whole web of it, people interdependent on one another. Um, in a larger society, it's a little harder to control, so you're more likely to have a more totalitarian type of government. They're going to be a lot more involved in how things work. And actually enforcing that system in a large society can be very difficult, and sometimes it can be very heavy-handed. Uh, the Soviet Union is a really good example where socialism turned into communism, and because it was such a large organization, they had to be very heavy-handed to enforce the structure. Now, free market capitalism is probably what a lot of us are used to, uh, where you exchange currency for goods and services. Um, this gives the individual an opportunity to make their own fortune through hard work. Um, coin and currency is going to be a lot more prevalent in this kind of society than the others. And you're going to have your markets and the cities and trade ports and things like that. Um, and economic disparity is going to probably be a lot more disparate here. You're going to have the very rich and the very poor. And certain echelons in between, but it's going to usually be the majority of the people are at the lower end. And um, with the government, you know, this invites a lot of opportunities for um, uh, corruption in the government. Now, you can mix the systems together depending on, you know, um, different areas. So you might have a large kingdom that is uh, socialist or vassalage, but there's a little isolated village somewhere um, that practices a different sort of economy. Um, you know, depending on how tied they are to each other, you may have a socialist village that cannot produce everything they need. So they interact with the free market economy and use their surplus to 
obtain the goods that they cannot produce themselves. A really good example of this is the two rivers from Robert George's Wheel of Time series. They were part of the kingdom of Andor, and most of them didn't even know it because they were so geographically isolated, and their own system of government was more of a uh, local socialist uh, helping your neighbor society versus the uh, vassalage feudal type society of Andor itself. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was thinking, I mean, of course, you, you could go whatever way you want with your own culture here, but but do you have any guidance for those world builders out there uh, watching this video, uh, you know, on how, how do you best decide which one to develop out of out of these three options you just mentioned? Mm. That is a difficult decision, and it really depends on what your end goals are with the society, what kind of uh, picture you have in mind for what you want to do. Um, if you're looking for that classic medieval knights and barons and counts and the king, you're looking at a vassalage. That's pretty much those titles are what made it what it was. Um, if you want your intrepid thief going around and your cut purse stealing coins, you're looking at more of a free market economy. Um, you know, if you've got your main characters, this, you know, farmer going up in this village and, you know, helping other people and you want to show a community bond, the socialism might be a good way to show that. Um, and of course we can mix different elements and you're not limited to just one, uh, especially people making epic fantasy. You're going to be looking at a lot of different cultures. So you're going to make, be making these decisions over and over and over again for different parts of your map. Yeah. Um, and and I, I was also thinking, you know, depending on what what whatever you, which one you go with, or or even a mixture of them, as you said, it also sets the bar for kind of the laws of the land. You know, what what are you allowed, and and uh, what what is what is considered a crime, what is not considered a crime. Uh, you touched a bit on the holidays early on as well, that, that, that sort of thing. All, it, it, the, the thing is, it's just everything here kind of ties together. So, so it, 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 when you start doing one thing, it affects another thing and so forth, don't you think? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, everything ties together. Um, and even a lot of my notes on this, they all tie to each other. Um, so you can't go down a laundry list of this is my religion, this is my ecology, this is my economics and my government. You really have to go down and kind of get a have a picture in your head before you start developing the society of what you want it to be like, and then look at each item and say, what does this need to be like to meet that end goal? If you just start piecing it together one piece at a time, um, it's going to be jumbled. It's going to be like a jigsaw puzzle that's not put together correctly. Um, mm -hmm. But if you have the picture in front of you of what the it's supposed to look like when you're done then you use these building blocks as tools to put pieces together in the right order. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Autumn and I are currently developing a course on world building, and, <laughs> and it's fun you say that because, because, because it's a course, so we have to kind of make it do this, do that, do that, do this, you know, so forth. So, so it becomes kind of a list, but, and then there, but then as we're building it, you, you can just see all the moving parts and there's a lot of optionals, you know, you can take one from there, one from there if you want and so forth. But, but uh, yeah, as you also saying, it, it gets pretty complicated and it, and it's, there's a lot to think about when you're developing a, a full culture for, for setting. And also the fact that uh, the world will have different countries, most likely, at least if it's a, it's a big world. Uh, and those will all be different cultures as well. Um, and then you can get back into the, uh, 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 the friction between countries and so forth, and then in some cases use the culture as your springboard to uh, to even spark wars if you want. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and you know, doing the world building even before you have a story, some people will do that, and you'll get motivation. You'll create your two cultures, and like you said, you've got a conflict between these two cultures, and that can give you an idea for an entire novel or series on its own. Um, sometimes. People will build a world around a story idea they already have. Other times you'll build a world and see, what can I get out of this? Yeah, yeah. I personally, I, I usually like to, I, I like to have the story idea, but then I, I, I will always do the world building uh, before I start writing. So I'll know what the story idea is, but but the thing is that once you start world building, uh, the, 
the amount of ideas that come out of that is incredible. There, there's so many things that just pops up like, oh, okay, I didn't even think about that, but now you, I, you have this whole new piece of the puzzle that you can work with. And, and so, so, yeah, I, you can go either way. There's also those who, who kind of just do the world building as they write. Uh, when, when it, as, and when it becomes relevant, they'll develop that little part and then that little part. And that's a lot also, but personally, I prefer to, uh, to do all my world building before I start writing. Oh, yes. yes. I'm a bit of a discovery writer myself, too. I do a lot of as I go. Um, but it's good to have a, a game plan before you start, at least a, a little sketch of, you know, where you're operating before you really get into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing around the, this whole culture that, that we've been talking about is also um, uh, it will also affect the look and feel of the world, won't it? So, so uh, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, uh, the vassalage is a good example of that again with your, you know, your knights and banners and things like, um, think of uh, the Song of Fire and Ice by George Martin, you know, heavily influenced by the War of the Roses in our own past. You know, the vassalage type society plays a huge role. It's its own character within that story, uh, among all the others. Um, so, yeah, your your government, your economics, I can all, it's a, it's really a character in itself, and like I said, it can spawn a lot of stories out of it, out of the uh, world building itself. Yeah, and, and e even how buildings in, in cities will look like, uh, you know, just like in the real world, where buildings in one, some countries looks vastly different from other countries' buildings and so forth, right? Oh yeah, it makes it more believable. It fleshes it out, gives you a reason. Uh, like with the heavy snowfall, gives you a reason to have a peaked roof. It's not just there because it's there. Uh, there's a reason for it. And then there's, if we look at our own past and our own architecture and beliefs and things like that, um, humanity didn't do things without reasons. So we can really learn a lot from our own history. And I think apply that to the history of our fictional worlds, that people had reasons for doing things. It wasn't just arbitrary. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but so when we are kind of facing this beast of developing the culture for a setting and there, there's so many different things to think about, where, where do you start? Where, where, where's, where's a good starting point? Is there any good starting point? I guess I could phrase it like that as well. Um, I think having the big picture in mind is a good starting point. Um, like I said I, uh, earlier, the cosmology is a big place where I'll start. Um, and then the lay of the land, you know, you kind of have your world and your heavens, so you have something to build on. Um, and then, you know, we go into the economy, of course, how people change goods. Um, government was actually the next thing I was going to touch on, yeah. um, is a big part of it too. And really it influenced a lot by the economy that we spoke about a few minutes ago, where if it's a, a vassalage or free market or socialist, it's going to affect the government a lot. Um, but then you got to think about, you mentioned earlier, you know, what is considered okay and taboo and what's valued versus not valued. Um, you know, what kind of laws does the land have? That's a good place to be too. Um, how important is money? Um, what's valued in the society is a good thing to think about too. Is it a, there's three big kinds of societies that, uh, excuse me, the hereditary society we talked about with the vassalage where people inherit titles uh, versus a meritocracy where you can earn um, your own, uh, your worth, you determine your own worth based off your actions, um, versus an oligarchy where wealth equals power. And you can set up a lot of conflicts with this. Um, one of my projects actually looks at a hereditary society with a protagonist that, uh, wishes it was a meritocracy. So he's trying to prove himself in a society that doesn't really allow that. Um, so you can set up conflict, of course, conflict glues everything together. That gives us a story. So you can make stories out of that too. Um, and then of course we talked about how religion plays a role in government. And because it all ties together, you can't really, you know, say I'm gonna start with the government, but you know, start with your world, get a big picture. And then let's say you want to focus on one individual civilization. But just think about, you know, past examples or what you want it to be like. Do you want it to be a caste system? Um, so is it an evil culture? Is this the Dark Lord's realm, you know, quote unquote, um, where it's going to be totalitarian, and, you know, probably doesn't have a lot of civil liberties. 
versus um, your protagonist culture, your hero's culture uh, might be a little more um, shiny and happy. Uh, just kind of depending on what you want it to be, then you look at, is it uh, an overpowering government? Is it a benevolent government? Is there religious oppression? Things like that. Um, all ties into it. You really have to just kind of consider all the puzzle pieces and then try to put them together. There's, it's hard to do like a checklist because it's so daunting. It's so complicated. Um, but having that big picture really gives you, when you know where you're trying to get at the end of the road, it makes it easier to get there. Yeah, and that, that's also why I, I like to have the story idea uh, or the premise for the story first, because mm. that also gives you a bit of an idea of what, what type of story is this. So, uh, you know, you're not going to create an apocalyptic world where everything is... Uh, <laughs> everything is destroyed if the idea of the story you're going to write is kind of a, a happy story or something you know so it, right. it needs to it matters what kind of story the, the world is built for um, yes. so and and I, I always say the same thing actually when it comes to making maps that um, never ever have something uh, because it appears on the map and forces into the story it's always the other way around so the story is the master so uh, everything else needs to serve the story, not the other way around. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the end goal. I mean, we're we're trying to write fiction, so the the story is. This is all building blocks to tell the story. Yeah, so, of course, that's the most important thing, and it depends on whether you want your story to involve knights or slaves or whatever. That's going to affect what kind of story you have. Exactly. Or yeah. what kind of setting you have. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so uh, Brian, is there anything else we need to cover before we finish off? Um, real briefly, I would talk. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about civil liberties and, of course, um, government and the religion and how that kind of ties into the individual's experience. I think is a, a kind of ties it together, <laughs> where um, we have a democracy versus republic, the government systems. Uh, does the individual have freedom to enter or exit the society? Is there emigration and immigration? Um, how do they view other societies and even other races, like your elves and your dwarves versus your humans? Um, what kind of beliefs and values do they have towards that? Um, do people have the option to say, I don't want to live here anymore, I'm going to go over there, or are they tied to where they are? And uh, are people from other lands allowed to come in? Um, and how much diversity do you have? Um, do you have a city where you have elves and dwarves and people from this empire and people from that kingdom and they're all getting along together? Or is it very closed off, uh, insular kind of society um, where there's a, not a lot of um, variety and, you know, social uh, tolerance and things like that? Um, what kind of prejudice do you have? And, um, what part? To what role do women play? I think is important. Sometimes we forget about um, being guys writing books that, uh, you know, we want to make sure we talk about the women and um, the society. Is it egalitarian? Do they have an equal role? Or is it a society where the women are actually in charge, a matriarchal type society? Um, we would need to think about that and make sure we treat that with respect too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, we, we've just for those out there watching, we, we, we're trying to make this uh, as inspirational and um, as easy to go about as possible. But but I have I also have to say that it, this is an extremely big topic, um, and there's a lot of things to consider. So um, so I, I hope that uh, I hope that <laughs> that you're getting all these good uh, points that uh, Brian is is mentioning uh, that that is helpful for you. But uh, but it, it is a very complicated uh, topic and uh, what probably one of the more intricate parts of, of world building, what won't you say, Brian? Absolutely, I think so. Because like I mentioned before, your culture can be its own character and it influences how you build your characters, which are the most important part of your story. Um, their own motivations and beliefs and why they're doing what they're doing. Um, it's based on what environment they grew up in. It makes it really important. Yeah. All right. So uh, where can people find out more about you, Brian, if they want to check out some of the stuff that you're uh, doing or checking you on social media and so forth? Where can they find you? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, I've got a website on WordPress. It's www.bkbass.wordpress.com. Um, you can find links to all of my other um, networking, um, Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff on there. Um, it has descriptions of all the books that I'm working on. Um, there's actually an essay that I wrote related to this topic that's on there. So that'd be a good place if people want some more information on this topic. Uh, they can go there and see that article. It's got a little more uh, in-depth, a little more organized information because I sat down and wrote it um, instead of talking. So I was able to organize the thoughts a little better. Um, so that's a good, good place to look. Um, I'm on Twitter very actively as uh, Twitter handle at capital B underscore capital K underscore capital B A S S P K Bass uh, with two underscores. You can find me on there. I'm very active with the community. Um, also on Patreon, there's links to all that on my uh, WordPress page. All right, cool. And if you if you email me uh, the different links to things, uh, Brian, then I'll put it in the description field below here for for people so they can just click through right there. So uh, if you email me whatever links you want me to put there, then, then I will make sure to do so. Oh, absolutely. Will do. And I appreciate anybody that visits those sites. Uh, I appreciate the support and the interest. And I really just, I have stories to tell and uh, really want to get uh, that out there and just for people to enjoy and uh, kind of contribute to our own society. Cool. Thanks a lot, uh, Brian. And, uh, and also, thank you so much for watching out there. Uh, as always, you uh, you can also support this channel if you want. Uh, it's also on Patreon. There is a link in the description field below uh, as well. So uh, other than that, then uh, all there is left to say is uh, stay safe out there and uh, see you next Monday.